Um, let's open up our Bibles this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes. And over the last um, few weeks, I've been sharing to our church about this very interesting book in the Bible, the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, how many of you guys have ever read this book before? Ecclesiastes? Okay, not many people. Um, for a long time, I, I didn't really know much about this book either. And it's right in the middle of the Old Testament, right after Psalms and Proverbs. And some people say this is one of the strangest books in the Bible. It's very unique and puzzling in many ways. And some people kind of question whether it should be in the Bible at all because of some of the things that it says. And you would think that a book um, writing that was written thousands and thousands of years ago by this king in a far away distant land, you wouldn't think that it has much to say to us today. But in fact, as I studied it, the more and more I see that this is actually one of the most relevant books of Scripture um, that we have today, out of the whole Bible. And I think it has some issues and some questions that are very, very pertinent to our life today, even in 2015. So let's take a look at um, the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll start at chapter 1, verse 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, came in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Every, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I want an interesting start um, to this book. Okay, this, uh, this writer here, who we don't know exactly who it is, but the evidence seems to point towards it's the son of David, um, Solomon, King Solomon. Uh, of course, there's a lot of biblical, uh, biblical scholars who are debating about that. Um, but he calls himself a teacher. And this book of Ecclesiastes is about the life of this teacher and his search for the answers to life questions. And he starts out by saying, meaningless, meaningless, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And this word meaningless is one that we see throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. It's from the Hebrew word uh, called hebel. Hebel and it's often translated as a breath or a vapor. You may imagine on a cold day, you go outside and you see your, your breath coming out, and it just kind of disappears in a second, right? like a vapor. And it's also translated futility, absurdity, or vanity. Five times in the book of Ecclesiastes is described as chasing after the wind. Okay, so imagine running outside and trying to catch the wind with your hand. Right? It's impossible. And the more you try and catch it, the more you try and catch it, the more you experience frustration. In English, we say it's like a dog chasing his tail. Right? You're spending a lot of energy, but you're not getting anything. You're not getting anything out of it. And so this writer of Ecclesiastes, the teacher, he says, life is meaningless. Life is meaningless. It's like chasing after the wind. It's like running and running, but not getting anywhere. And he goes on to say in verse 3, What does man gain from all his labor at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go. The earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets, and he hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough seeing, nor the ear is filled with hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. Even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. Now these are the words of a man who is experiencing frustration. And maybe some of us can relate to him, to, to the great teacher. Sometimes our lives feel like we're just stuck in a cycle. Right? We do the same thing day after day. We get up, we go to work, we come home, we cook dinner, we drive the kids to school, we come back, pick them up, we pay the bills, we clean the house, and we do it all over again. The next day we do the same thing. And the next day we do the same thing. And maybe some of us can, can sympathize with the teacher here. And it feels like we're stuck in this cycle. And then we say the same question. What is the point of it all? Is that all there is? To this life? Are we just chasing after the wind, like a dog chasing after his tail? And here the teacher begins to go on a quest. 
He says, let me search and let me seek out whether there's truly meaning in this life. All right, or is it just the same thing again and again with nothing new under the sun? And so in verse 12, we see that he begins his search. He says, I, I a teacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun, all of them meaningless, the chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I have grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Okay, so he begins to explore. He says, maybe I can find what life is all about by searching for knowledge and wisdom. Maybe if I go and explore the great teachings of the world, I can find the answer to my questions. I remember one time I took a philosophy class, and I found that this was the same conclusion that I found. That seeking more wisdom actually doesn't bring us meaning. Meaning is not found in knowledge. Before I took this class, I was very excited. I said, okay, I have an opportunity to study um, the great philosophers, to explore the deep wisdom of the world, and to find the answers to all these questions that people are asking. But what I found was that with every explanation, with every answer to a question, there's five more questions. And with every argument, there's five more counter-arguments. And if you ever study philosophy, you'll see that the more and more you read, the less and less answers you actually find. In fact, people ask more and more things. And in fact, many of the great philosophers of the world, they kind of come to the same conclusion. They say, you know what? All there is is for us to live and to die. And then we disappear from this world, and the world goes on without us. And here, the teacher, he says the same thing. As much as I search for wisdom, all I found was more answers, just chasing after the wind. I think a lot of people today, they look at all of our technology and scientific advancement, and they say, if only we had more understanding of the world, then we would have a better life. Then we could find happiness and meaning. I remember reading how back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, people began to experience a lot of new technologies. Uh, they had automatic washing machines and dishwashers, and started to have computers. And they said, just imagine the world in 50 years we won't have to do anything. We won't have to work at all. Housewives can just take it easy. Now we won't only have to work a few hours a day because of all the technology that we'll have in the future. Have we gotten there? No. Right? Have our lives become any happier than 50, 60 years ago? Maybe not. With all the technological advancement that we have, has it brought us more happiness and meaning? In fact, as Americans, we live in the most technologically advanced nation in the world. We have all the latest computers and gadgets and products. We have a better standard of living than any time in history. But we still have this question. Are people any happier than they were at any other time? Has all this knowledge brought us meaning? Or have you just found like this, like this teacher that is all just chasing after the wind? And so they come to this conclusion that meaning is not found in knowledge. Meaning is not found, just the knowledge. Let's read on in chapter 2. I thought in my heart, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well, the delights of all the heart of men. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. 
My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. Chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Okay, so here the teacher, he says, meaning was not found in knowledge. So let me try something else. Let me try pleasure. Okay, let me go and experience all the pleasures of this world. And he says, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. And it's kind of like today, I will sometimes we see on TV, these eccentric millionaires or celebrities, they travel all around the world, right? They eat in the finest uh, restaurants. They stay in four-star hotels, uh, exotic re resort islands. They fly in their private jets and eat the finest of food and experience the finest of entertainment. It seems like they have everything that this world can offer. They have all of their pleasures and desires fulfilled. But the question is, are they truly happy? Do their lives have meaning? And I think that what we see over and over again is that even these people who have everything that they want, they, they find that something is still missing. So meaning is not found just in fulfillment of pleasure. Imagine that you could have exactly what you wanted any time. Imagine you could go out and buy anything you wanted in the stores and all online. Would that make you happy? What if we could get every single thing that we wanted? I think probably a lot of us would just find ourselves even more unhappy. We would find ourselves even more unsatisfied with the world. A lot of people in this world, they chase after this life of pleasure. Their whole lives are centered around meeting their desires. They say, if only I could have more money, or if I could have a better job, if only I could save up enough money to retire, you know, I could go travel, I could go on cruises, I could play golf every day. I could relax and take it easy. No more working, no more trouble, no more stress. And then I would be happy. Then I would be happy. Then my life would be full. We know that these things only lead to more emptiness. But that's what we seek for the meaning of our lives. There's never enough pleasure in this world that can fulfill our deepest desires. And in the end, we'll find ourselves just chasing after the wind. And so the great teacher, he says, Meaning is not found in filling our pleasure. And let's read on in verse 20, chapter 2, verse 20. He says, So my heart began to despair to, over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who does not work for it. This too is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man gain for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days... All his days his work is pain and grief. Even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. So the great teacher, he goes on and he says, Maybe I'll find my meaning and achievement. Maybe I'll go and work and accomplish great things. People will look at what I've done and they'll admire me. They'll say, this person was successful. This was a great man who did great things. And so he threw himself into his work. But again, what did he find? He said, this too is meaningless, like chasing after the wind. There's some people in this world who dedicate their whole lives to achievement, okay, to working hard, and to accomplishing great things. And they spend their whole lives building their career, building their resume, chasing their next promotion, or new job title, or new job that will pay more and have more prestige. Building a bigger company, working day and night, trying to get more, and trying to accomplish more. What happens in the end? They find that there is no satisfaction there. There's just disappointment. Even as pastors, sometimes we have the same mindset. Right? We say, if only my church will grow to 50, or 75, or 100, then I'll feel like I accomplished something great. Then I'll be happy. But what happens? Even when you reach that goal, there's always another goal. Right? There's even always something more that can be done. We can find ourselves just chasing after the wind. I think about all the hard work and lives that have gone into building the great companies um, in our nation. But at the same time, with all the work that goes into it, so often they're just forgotten a few years later. And when, when I was growing up, the big companies were like IBM and Microsoft. Right? Those, those were companies that everyone wanted to work for, and we thought were like the greatest companies in the world. 
And now they're they're being forgotten. And no one talks about IBM or Microsoft anymore. It's all about Google and Apple. What's the next biggest thing? And all the I think about all the work that people went into building those companies, but they they've been left in the past. Even just some of the great um, car manufacturers in our country, people invested so hard into building these great companies like Ford, GM, Chrysler. Just a few years ago, they almost all went out of business. They literally had to be rescued by our government. And I think about all, those, all the blood, sweat, and tears that people put into those companies, and they are almost all forgotten. Us, as Americans, we work harder than anyone else in the world. We work longer hours, less vacation, more stress, and more tiredness. Yet through it all, what do we really accomplish? Do we still find meaning in it, or are we just chasing after the wind? And what does he say here? He says, with all his days, his work is pain and grief, and even at night, his mind does not rest. Even at night, his mind does not rest. Right? Can any of us relate to that? When you come home from work, your mind is still churning, right? When you're lying in bed, you're still thinking about all the things you have to do in the office or at work. And that's where we find ourselves, not happy, not meaningful, but just chasing after the wind, working and working harder and harder, but not finding meaning and purpose in our search. So let's turn to one more passage, chapter 5. Let's get ahead and find this last place where he searches. This great teacher. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. So this too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner, except to feast his eyes on them? Verse 15. Naked a man comes from a mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry with his hand. And right here, finally, he says, of all the things that we chase after, of all then maybe the one that we seek the most is money. And he says, even money can never satisfy us. Whoever loves money never has enough. And whoever loves wealth can never be satisfied. And somebody once said, how much money do you need to be happy? And someone answered, just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. And I think for, us, for probably all of us, that's how we feel sometimes. If only I just had a little bit more money. If only I didn't have to worry so much about paying for college. If only I had a little bit more money in my retirement account, then I wouldn't have to worry or stress. Then I would be happy. Then I could relax. But what does he say? Whoever loves money never has enough. And no matter how much we get, we'll always want more. <coughs> money itself can never bring us happiness or meaning or security. In verse 11, he says, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. Basically saying, the more things that we get, the more it just sits there. The more it is for us to just look at it and stare at it with our eyes. It doesn't bring us, bring us happiness. I think for us, um, this is probably one of the biggest messages that we hear in our culture. If you buy more things, if you get nicer things, you'll be happy. Right? If you get that nicer car, buy that bigger house, buy those newest gadgets, those things will make you happy. But what do we find? The bigger we get, the more stuff we get, it actually brings us more stress, more trouble, more things we have to worry about. Um, one, one parent did a study and they found that their kids had, on average, about 150 toys per child. Mm -hmm. right? and those of you with like, grandkids or kids, you probably see that that's true. Right? There's just piles and piles of toys. And so the parents said, I'm just going to get rid of all of these toys, except maybe just four or five for each child. Probably all of us would think that those children would be crying, would be throwing a fit. But what did she find? She found that the children are actually happy. You know, they said, we'll just play with these few toys that we really like, and we'll just use our imaginations more. And they were just as happy with less toys. And what a message for us, even as adults. Right? We think the more we get, the more we'll be happier. But in fact, we can be happy with much less. In fact, I find that a lot of my free time is devoted to cleaning up all the toys that my kids have and worrying about all my own stuff. Taking care of the house, cutting the lawn, fixing the cars, you know, taking care of all these things. And rather than bringing us happiness, 
just brings us more trouble and stress. But yet we say, well, if only I get something else, then I'll be happy. Right? But that's just chasing after the wind. No amount of money or possessions can really bring us meaning in this life. I read an article about a young man who, when he was in his 20s, he was part of a tech startup. He sold his company for $15 million at the age of 20, in his mid-20s. And we would think, what an amazing life this person has. He has everything that we could ever dream of. He's living the American dream. But what do you say? He said, what I found is being rich is better than being not rich. It's better than being poor. But it's not nearly as good as you might imagine it is. It's not nearly as good as you might imagine it is. He says, when you're rich, no one wants to listen to your problems. They say, how can you complain about your life? You have it made. What do you have to complain about? He says, when you're rich, it changes your relationships. People come to you because they want money from you. Even your own family members, it's hard to be close to them because they always have expectations. Even if you buy them a gift, they always have this feeling that, oh, you should have gotten me something even nicer. <laughs> Maybe you should have, should have even given me more. As a single person, he says, it's very hard to find love because you never know if someone really cares for you or if they're just after your money. So he said, I don't know if I'll ever find someone who really loves me. He says, you never, being rich is, is not good because you never get excited about the things you have. Because you can always just get more, you get whatever you want. You never experience the pleasure of getting something new. He says, being rich is not so wonderful because you stay up late at night wondering if, made, if you've made the right choices. And, one, and you wonder whether at some point you're going to lose everything. Just worry and worry about all that you have. And finally, he says, when people get rich, they think their lives will become better. But many of them find that riches don't bring happiness. And so their lives are thrown into a serious crisis. Their lives are thrown into a serious crisis. Some of them never recover from it because they thought that money would bring them happiness. And in the conclusion, he says, what I found is that if you're not happy now, you won't be happy because of money. If you're not happy now, you won't be happy because of money. And if we're not happy with what we have, we'll never be happy when we get more. So this is the message that Ecclesiastes tells us. That meaning is not found in knowledge. Meaning is not found in pleasure. Meaning is not found in achievement, money, or possessions. But these things are only chasing after the wind. They're all found meaningless and so where's the answer? Where do we find true meaning and happiness in this life? Let's turn finally to the end of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 10. The teacher, he says, Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach, when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grew dark, and the clouds returned after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds and all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire is no, is no longer stirred. Then man goes to his eternal home, and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, remember the Creator. Before the silver cord is severed, or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, or the wheel is broken at the wheel, and the dust returns to the ground where it came from, and the spirit returns to God and made it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Verse 9. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads, their collective sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study rears the body. Now all has been heard, and here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil.
And so it begins by saying, remember your creator in the days of your youth. And here he's kind of speaking to young people. Here I see some young people, like Carissa. I mean, he's kind of saying to Carissa, remember your creator while you're young. Okay? Don't wait until the light has faded and the sun has set. You've lived your whole life and everything is gone. And you've chased after all these things. And then turn to God. But he says, remember your creator. Remember the one who made you. Remember the one who gave you life. And when you search out this creator, your Lord, your God, you'll find that meaning comes from knowing him. Meaning doesn't come from all these things of the world. Meaning doesn't come from the things that are created. But meaning comes from the creator. Meaning comes from the creator. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. In Ecclesiastes 5, he says this, I realize that it's good and proper for a man to eat and drink, to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun, and during the few days of his life God has given him, for this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift from God. He seldom reflects on the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with kindness of heart. You're saying that if we're to experience happiness and meaning and joy in our life, it's a gift from God. This is a gift from God. It's not something that we can chase after and seek for ourselves. But happiness is a gift from Him. When we begin to order our lives around God's purposes for us, how He created us to be, that's when we find meaning and purpose. In verse chapter 12, verse 13, he says, this is what it all comes down to. This is the end of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Fear God and keep his commandments. And this fear of God is not a terror. It's not being scared that God will strike us down. But it's fearing God in the sense of respecting him, honoring him, reverencing him, and standing in awe of him, submitting to him, and worshiping him. It's living our lives with him at the center saying that I'm not the most important one, but my life is here to be lived for my Lord, okay, to live in relation to my Creator. We fear a lot of things in this life. We fear our boss. We fear our superiors. We fear losing our job. We fear sickness or death or disaster or crime or terrorism. We fear losing our homes or our finances. We fear something happening to our families. But do we really fear the Lord? Jesus said, don't fear the one that can kill the body, but fear the one who holds your life in his hand. Fear the Lord. Live in awe and respect of him. And when we live like that, it gives our life a different perspective. It says that we are put here to serve him. And we are here to honor him with our lives. It's not about getting what we want, what we think will satisfy us, but doing what God wants. Doing what God wants. Fear the Lord and obey his commands. Many times people say, how do we know what God wants? Okay, the Bible is such a big book with so many commands. But I think it's very, very simple. Somebody once looked at the Ten Commandments and they explained it in a very simple way. Commandment one, worship God first. Number two, don't worship lesser things. Number three, honor God's name. Number four, make time to rest. Don't work all the time. Number five, honor your parents. Number six, Respect the lives of others. Number seven, be faithful to your marriage. Number eight, don't steal. Number nine, be honest. Number ten, be content with what you have. And these are just very simple commands that God has given us. They're not difficult. They're not meant to be a burden to us. They're not meant for God to punish us or to restrict us. But in fact, these God's commands give us a better life. God's commands give us freedom from the things of this world from the sin that entangles us. And he says, just fear God and obey his commands. And one time someone asked Jesus, out of all the commands, what is the most important thing? And when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Jesus says, out of everything in this world, out of everything that you're doing, the most important thing is just love the Lord your God. And love him with all your heart, all your soul, all of your minds, with everything that you have, all your resources, all of your possessions, all of your health, all of your energy, put that towards loving the Lord, not chasing after the wind. And when you do, 
That's where you'll find satisfaction. That's where you'll find meaning. In Matthew 6, Jesus said, Jesus said, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You seek God's kingdom first, and all these things will be given to you. You don't have to worry about anything else but seeking his kingdom first. In Psalm 73, the psalmist says this, Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Saying, out of everything in this world, there's only one thing that really satisfies us. There's only one thing that can meet our deepest desires. And that's our relationship with God. There's nothing more satisfying. There's nothing more long-lasting. There's nothing more meaningful than knowing our God, knowing our Lord. There's nothing in this world that can satisfy our longings. No person, no job, no amount of money <clears throat> or possessions. Only knowing our Lord and living the life Hearing him and obeying his commands. Somebody once asked the great evangelist and preacher, Billy Graham, what's the greatest thing that you've experienced in your life? I think many of us know Billy Graham. He was um, the great, greatest preacher of his time. He traveled all around the world, preaching to millions. He met um, the most powerful people in the world, heads of states, politicians, world leaders, celebrities, all kinds of famous people. He was broadcast on TV to millions and millions of people around the world. He was literally a household name. And someone said, what was the greatest experience that you've had in your life? And here's what he said. I uh, None of those things. By far the greatest joy in my life has been my fellowship with Jesus. Hearing him speak to me, having him guide me, sensing his presence with me, and his power through me. This has been the highest pleasure of my life. Not meeting famous people, not being known by millions, but simply knowing Jesus. This has been the highest pleasure of my life. This has been the highest pleasure. And as Billy Graham traveled around the world preaching to millions, um, he had someone with him, a great man named uh, George Beverly Shea. And he was known for his uh, beautiful singing voice. And he's known throughout his life for singing his own song. Um, he called it his testimony. And I think probably a lot of us know it. It's called I'd Rather Have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than still the Lord. I'd rather be his than have riches on fold. I'd rather have Jesus than all to the lands. I'd rather be led by his nearest hand than to be the king of the vast domain or be held in sins that I would rather have Jesus than anything than this world today he's fairer than the lips of rarest bloom he's sweeter than honey from out the foam he's all that your hungering spirit needs Oh, I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be a king of all the vast of domain or be held in sin's red I would rather have Jesus than anything than this world affords today. So I want to ask you this question this morning. 
What are you chasing with your life? What are you chasing with your life? Are you chasing meaning and money or possessions or work or accomplishments? Are you chasing the one thing that will truly satisfy? The one thing that will truly give you meaning? There's an old saying that no one laid on their deathbed and said, I wish I spent more time at the office. Right? <laughs> no one says that at the end of their life. And I think we can apply that to a lot of things. No one ever laid on their deathbed and said, I wish I spent more time watching TV. Or I wish I spent more time shopping at the mall. Or I wish I spent more time surfing the internet or on Facebook. But I think a lot of people, when they come to the end of their life, they say, you know, I wish I spent more time seeking the one thing that really matters. I wish I spent more time growing closer to the Lord. I wish I spent more time preparing my heart for eternity and just chasing after the Lord. I want to ask you this morning, what are you chasing with your life? Are you chasing something that's just temporary? Are you chasing something that will quickly fade away? Are you chasing the most important thing? Are you chasing after the Creator? Let's bow our heads today. God, we thank you this morning that you gave us the most important thing. Lord, you gave us a source of true meaning in life. Lord, you gave us life through your, your creation, through <coughs> our relationship with you. Lord, you gave us life through your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and forgave us for all of our sins so that we could have a new life with you. And God, we pray for each person here this morning that you'll help us not to seek after all the meaningless things that you'll help us not have lives just chasing after the wind, but that you'll help us to have lives that chase after you. And that we will want nothing more than to know you more, more than riches or worldwide fame, but that you would be the one thing that we would rather have. And Lord, help us <coughs> to seek after you with all of our hearts, our souls, our minds, and our strength. And help us to have meaningful lives for now and for eternity. And we thank you for all the ways you blessed us and graced us. We thank you for your goodness to us. For all that you bless us with. We thank you for everything. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Shall we all stand for a benediction? Dear God, we thank you so much for the reminder and the challenge to us and to our heart this morning. Of how we need to seek you first, to put you above all things. Lord, this is what life is all about. And help us, Lord, as we leave this place. May our mind be on you, not on riches, not on work, not on anything. Because, Lord, when we have you, we have everything. We pray this in Christ's precious name.